In a previous video, we talked about how gas exchange occurs between the lungs and the atmosphere and how alveoli are the sites of actual gas exchange where oxygen from the air that is inhaled is picked up by the blood and transported to all parts of the body. In this video, we are going to specifically talk about how oxygen is transported within the body. So at the alveoli, at the actual sites of gas exchange, oxygen diffuses out of the alveoli and enters the bloodstream where it is picked up by red blood cells or erythrocytes. So if you think of oxygen as the cargo that needs to be transported to all cells and red blood cells is the truck that transports the cargo. But what is the actual carton box or the container in which oxygen is transported inside the red blood cells? That is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a metalloprotein. It is made up of four subunits and each subunits contain a ion or a heme group. So the heme group contains a Fe, Fe atom, ion atom to which oxygen goes and binds. And it is this hemoglobin that transports oxygen to all parts of the body. This is probably why your parents and elders always ask you to eat a lot of green leafy vegetables, apples and other sources of iron because iron is very important for the formation of hemoglobin, transport of oxygen and the proper functioning of the body. So if you think of oxygen as the cargo, the hemoglobin is the carton box in which the cargo is transported and the red blood cells are the trucks, pickup trucks in which the carton boxes are transported. Your blood has millions of red blood cells and within each red blood cell there are millions of hemoglobin as well. So I just told you that hemoglobin has four of these ion centers, right? Which means that each hemoglobin protein can transport four oxygen molecules. So if these are the sites that contain iron, these are the sites where oxygen can come and bind. So the mechanism by which oxygen binds to hemoglobin is known as cooperative binding. Now what does this mean? So when oxygen is binding to hemoglobin, all four molecules do not bind at the same time. Initially, when the oxygen enters the red blood cells, only one oxygen molecule initially binds to the hemoglobin. It comes and bumps into hemoglobin and binds to one of the iron containing centers. Now after one molecule of oxygen has bound to hemoglobin, then this protein undergoes a conformational change which causes an increased affinity to oxygen. Now with this increased affinity, three more molecules can bind to the three more open now exposed sites. So this is known as cooperative binding. Now this protein now which is bound to oxygen is known as oxyhemoglobin. Apart from oxygen binding sites, hemoglobin has other binding sites known as allosteric sites. And at these sites, two different substances can bind to it, which are hydrogen ions or protons and carbon dioxide. Now, where do we get this hydrogen ions from? So what happens is within the cells, carbon dioxide is produced as a result of cellular respiration, right? So this carbon dioxide diffuses out of the cells and enters the red blood cells. We'll talk more about how carbon dioxide is transported in a later video. But for now, let's just understand that carbon dioxide diffuses out of the cells and enters the red blood cells where this enzyme carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the reaction between carbon dioxide and water. This results in the formation of a very short-lived compound known as carbonic acid. Now, if you remember a uh, property of acids is that when acids dissociate, they dissociate into conjugate base and protons, right? This carbonic acid is highly unstable and it immediately dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Now, we'll talk more about the bicarbonate ions in the video for carbon dioxide transport. But this is where we get the hydrogen ions from. So hydrogen ions and carbon dioxide have allosteric sites on this hemoglobin apart from the sites where oxygen can bind. So we can say that hemoglobin is allosterically inhibited by protons and carbon dioxide. So now let's move on to the actual transport of oxygen. It is the partial pressure that is involved in the movement of oxygen from the lungs into the red blood cells. So the pathway that the oxygen takes inside the body is that at the alveoli oxygen is diffused into the red blood cells and inside the red blood cells it binds to hemoglobin and then is transported to all cells and tissues.
Now, this difference in partial pressure, if you remember what is partial pressure, it's the pressure exerted by each gas in a mixture of gases. So, when we talk about gases in our body, we speak mainly about oxygen and carbon dioxide. They are the two main gases in our body. So, we are going to talk about partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So, the partial pressure gradient is what is needed to move oxygen from the alveoli into the red blood cells and from the red blood cells into the tissues. So, if you remember, gases always move from a region of higher pressure to a region of lower pressure. So, from that itself, you can guess that the pressure gradient is like this in this direction. So, the partial pressure of oxygen is the greatest in the lungs. It decreases in red blood cells and then it is the least in the cells and tissues. Why do you think partial pressure of oxygen is least in the cells and tissues? So, after the cells and tissues have obtained oxygen, the blood is going to go back to the lungs and get oxygenated again. Conversely, for carbon dioxide, it's going to be in the reverse direction. Carbon dioxide is produced in the cells and tissues as a result of cellular respiration, right? From that, it enters the blood and some of it is also picked up by the red blood cells. We just saw here about this equation, right? So, carbon dioxide is going to be picked up by red blood cells and then that's going to be transported back to the alveoli from where it is exhaled out. So, you can guess the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is in the reverse direction. It is the highest in the cells and tissues and the least in the lungs and alveoli. So, this partial pressure is important for oxygen to leave the lungs and enter the red blood cells. But what about binding of oxygen to hemoglobin? So, we'll talk about the loading of oxygen. In the alveoli, in the lungs, the partial pressure of oxygen is high. We just saw that. Also, to allow for oxygen to bind with hemoglobin, the concentration of hydrogen ions is less. How? Because when this hydrogen ions and these bicarbonate ions reach the alveoli, the reverse of this reaction is going to take place. It binds with bicarbonate, gives carbonic acid, which then the reverse of this reaction results in the production of carbon dioxide and water. That is why the concentration of hydrogen ions is going to be less in the alveoli. So now, because there is no hydrogen or carbon dioxide to compete with hemoglobin, the unloaded hemoglobin, this can be called as deoxyhemoglobin, the unloaded hemoglobin that's come to the alveoli for oxygenation, can now pick up the oxygen from the alveoli. So, you have four oxygen here that's going to diffuse into the red blood cells and then it's going to bind to hemoglobin with the help of cooperative binding. Now, this oxyhemoglobin is going to be transported to all peripheral tissues where the oxygen has to be unloaded. It needs to unload from the RBC and enter the cells and tissues. Basically, oxygen needs to dissociate from hemoglobin, leave the RBC and enter the cells. How does that happen? So, in the cells and tissues, we just saw that the partial pressure of oxygen is low. And conversely, there is a high concentration of protons and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is also going to be high. So, now the hemoglobin that has come to the cells is loaded with oxygen. It contains four oxygen molecules. Somehow, the oxygen needs to dissociate or unbind from hemoglobin and then exit the red blood cells and enter the cells. So, what happens now is that the H plus ions in the RBC is going to come and tell oxygen, hey oxygen, you've reached your address. You have to get down now and it's my turn to be carried back to the lungs. So, you have to get down now. So, hydrogen is going to come and nudge the uh, hemoglobin protein slowly, slowly. And that's going to cause the unbinding of oxygen from hemoglobin. And as one of the oxygen molecules unbinds, then again, the reverse of cooperative binding occurs. As one is unloaded, all the other three are also unloaded. And because of the difference in the partial pressure gradient, this is going to have more partial pressure than the cells, right? Partial pressure of oxygen. Because of the partial pressure gradient, oxygen is going to move out of red blood cells and into the peripheral cells and tissues. So, this is how unloading of oxygen works and which is why this equation and the presence of hydrogen ions is going to be very important. So, now once this oxygen has been unloaded into the cells, this uh, free hemoglobin, you can think of it as a free hemoglobin, that is known as deoxyhemoglobin. So, this is the loading and unloading of oxygen.
Now, based on this, based on the partial pressure of oxygen and based on how much of hemoglobin is bound to oxygen, we can plot an oxygen dissociation curve. And what this oxygen dissociation curve shows is on the x-axis, it's going to have the partial pressure of oxygen in mmHg. And on the y-axis, it's going to have the saturation of hemoglobin, which means how much of hemoglobin is bound to oxygen. And if you plot it, it's going to give a sigmoid curve. This shape is known as a sigmoid curve. So initially, as the partial pressure is less, there is no oxygen that is bound to it. So as the partial pressure slowly increases, oxygen starts binding to hemoglobin and oxygen is binding to hemoglobin. Cooperative binding is going to increase the saturation of oxygen in hemoglobin. At high partial pressure of oxygen, uh, hemoglobin is going to be completely saturated at 100% of oxygen. So at this stage, no more oxygen can come and bind with hemoglobin. It is fully saturated. So hemoglobin's job now is to unload oxygen at the peripheral cells and tissues. So with this, we are ending the transport of oxygen. We'll talk more about the transport of carbon dioxide in another video.